Hello there, Atheist Jr. here, your friend and humble narrator. Well, it seems now that Matt Powell has become bunk buddies with Kent Hovind down in Backwoods, Alabama, he's influencing him to edit videos in the way that he does. That is, short, highly gish gallop filled videos about one topic that hit the viewer with misinformation like a fire hose. So let's see Kent Hovind attempt to talk about earth science and the geologic column. Hey folks, here we are at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. This was a gravel pit for years. They dug down about 30 feet of t all the gravel, sand, and clay out of here, and they stopped right here at this cliff. You can still see these gravel layers. These layers go all the way to North Carolina, 500 miles. Why would there be gravel layers? Why did they stop after 500 miles? If you think that there was a global flood that deposited these gravel layers, then shouldn't they be on every square inch of land all over the Earth? Before I answer your question about why we have gravel layers, I think I need to define a few terms. Gravel is defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a loose jumbled aggregate of rock fragments that are in between 2 millimeters and 80 millimeters in diameter. This definition distinguishes it from rubble, which has angular pieces instead of rounded ones. This causes it to be rounded off because of abrasion, and eventually it is able to settle to the bottom of shorelines, streams, and lake beds. On a geologic timeline, when these deposits contain more than 30% gravel, they eventually become lithified into solid rock, which is called a conglomerate. Hmm, it's gravel, sand, clay. The kids are taught in school that each of the layers of the earth is a different age. The geologic column is one of the biggest lies ever taught in the history of the world. The geologic column does not exist. There's no such thing as a Jurassic age or Triassic or Mississippian. It's all baloney. Uh, the geologic column does exist. You can see it for yourself in the following places. But the kids are being taught the principle of superposition, which simply states the obvious fact that the layers that are the highest are going to be younger than the layers that are the lowest. That's a good thing. And this is a principle of geology that is incredibly base level. Younger creationists like Hovind think that all animals existed at the same time, but we don't see a jumbled mix of every animal fossil in every layer. What we see is distinct fossils in distinct layers. And early 1900s paleontologists dubbed these All these layers formed at the same time. They say the top layer is younger. I say, really? Where did it come from? Every time people come to our tour here, we show them this little jar <clears throat> that I shake up. It always settles out into gravel, sand, clay. Gravel, sand, clay. So, I actually have to give Kent Hovind some credit here. His little jar experiment, I think, is the closest I've ever seen him to actually doing a scientific experiment. So, we're going to do some peer review and repeat his experiment and see what results I get. But, uh, since this is YouTube, I don't want to just make a jar full of ugly, muddy water, and I'm going to use some colorful purple sand and some green whipped clay so that not only does it look good on camera and gives me a good thumbnail, hopefully we'll be able to see, based on the different colors, if it gives us distinct layers. Okay, so I've already got my gravel on the bottom, so we're going to add the sand. Now I'm going to add a small amount of this whipped clay because I tried this experiment before and I added the entire tube and it was just way too much and it completely dyed the water to where I couldn't see anything. So I'm just going to do a small amount. Oh yeah. Doesn't that look nice? Okay, now we're going to add the water. I'm going to try and go pretty much all the way to the top. And then I'm going to shake this up really well. I'm going to film it in slow motion when it settles, and then I'm going to film the rest of it in a little bit of a time lapse. So 
Be right back. Okay, so it's been about five hours. Uh, I've let this sit here, and it seems to me that the sand, which again is purple, the green clay, you can see some of it right there, and the gravel has all sort of settled at the bottom in one layer. Um, there might be a sort of layer of clay right here, but again, the clay sort of stained the water. But it seems to me that the result I got is very similar to Kent Hovind's result because in his video, I didn't see three distinct layers of just gravel, just sand, and just clay. It seems like everything was sort of mixed together. Every time people come, we flip this little thing over, and it always makes hundreds of little bitty layers. Now, wait a minute. They tell the kids the layers are different ages. If you shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger? No, they're all the same age. In your example, when do we begin counting the lifespan for each card? This isn't a good analogy for horizontal geologic layers being laid down on top of each other one at a time. So a better question would be, if I have a deck of cards and I stack them in a new pile one at a time, is the very bottom card older than the very top card? Well, yes, if it takes you five minutes to make the new pile, and we start counting as soon as each card is in the new pile, then the very bottom card would be about five minutes old, and the very top card would be considered to be about one or two seconds old. This geologic column is one of the biggest hoaxes ever. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting all the layers. Well, how long does a dead tree stand around? So Kent is referring to polystrate trees, a classic creationist argument. But this is not a term that geologists use. They call these upright fossils. But even if a flood caused this, and it didn't have to be a global flood, it could have been a local flood, but even if it did, this isn't a problem for uniformitarian geology. Single floods can deposit sediments that are several feet thick. Furthermore, trees that are buried in such sediments do not die and decay immediately. Their trunks can last up to years or even decades. Although I'm sure Hoven would say, oh, wherever Noah's Ark was, the waters were calm right there. Hoven. Here at this latitude in Lenox, 31 degrees above the equator, we're turning almost 900 miles an hour. The sideways moving water at 900 miles an hour would do, take all the rocks and roll them against each other like a rock tumbler does and round them off. All over the world, gravel is rounded. They call it river rock. No, this is from the flood. It was rounded back and forth by the tide going back and forth. These rounded rock layers go to North Carolina. If that's a river, that's a big river. 500 miles. Of course gravel all over the world is rounded. By definition gravel is rounded. But saying that water that was moving 900 miles an hour would round these rocks off and then deposit gravel layers is not accurate. The way that gravel, which is called river rock for a reason, is deposited is it's carried by rivers and then when the rivers slow down, like if a river makes a U-turn, the gravel has time to sink to the bottom of the river or shoreline or lake bed. That's not going to happen in turbulent, chaotic water that's moving 900 miles an hour. So you're contradicting yourself in your own video, Kent, because for your jar example, you shake up the jar of water, sand, and gravel, but then you set it down and say, oh, look at these layers forming. But that's only because you're setting the jar down and letting the water sit calmly. But you're not shaking the jar at 900 miles an hour, are you? All over the world, petrified clams are found. Normally when you find seashells along the beach, as soon as they die, they open. Well, and you hardly ever find a matched pair. But all over the world, petrified clams are found in the closed position. Petrified closed clams. It had to be buried alive, quickly. If the water came up 200 feet and came in at 900 miles an hour, it's going to make a layer of mud 50 feet thick in 10 seconds and bury the clam beds. 
They find petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest. Tallest mountain in the world full of seashells. Now let's take a look at some real fossils and what these guys are probably calling closed clams. These are fossils from the hillside east of Payson, Arizona that I mentioned earlier. There isn't a single clam in this image. Here's a whole handful of what they would probably call clams in a closed position that I collected in just a few minutes from that hillside. Here's one that I collected from the top of the Mogollon Rim that it eroded out of the Kaibab limestone. If you haven't guessed it yet, what you've been looking at here are brachiopods. Both brachiopods and clams are bilaterally symmetrical, but in different ways. If you look at a brachiopod from the top, the left half will be same as the right half, both bottom and top. If you look at a clam that way, they won't necessarily be the same. You have to look at where the valves are joined. If you look at a clam that way, each half will be the same. I found a great explanation online as to how brachiopods and clams differ physically and why one would open up when it dies and the other one won't. Both brachiopods and bivalves have two major muscles within the shell to keep it closed. Brachiopods have what are called adductor muscles. These muscles contract to keep the two valves closed. Bivalves also have adductor muscles that contract to keep the valves closed. So why do I bring this up as a difference? Bivalves have a second structure that separates them from the brachiopods. This structure is a ligament that joins the valves dorsally. When the adductor muscles in a bivalve relax, the ligament forces the two valves open. This is why bivalve or clam shells are often found in a butterfly pattern where both valves have opened. Now most brachiopods went extinct at the end of the Permian, but there still are about 300 species living mainly in deeper and colder water than their ancient relatives. But what about clams that are buried in the closed position? Is there a good explanation for that? Well, many species of clams spend most of their life buried in the sand. All it would take is for a clam to die while it was buried. It would be completely covered in sediment and unable to open. So once again, there's always a good answer and it never requires a biblical flood. These creationism salesmen rely on misinformation or misrepresentation of the information to fool their followers. Today, the world's record biggest oysters, 14 inches. They find fossilized oysters in the mountains in Peru, 500 of them, all bigger than the world's record. Here's a guy laying on one. There's 11 and a half foot oyster found two miles above sea level. I think there was a flood. If the water came up 200 feet and came in at 900 miles an hour, it's gonna knock all the trees down and bury them under a layer of mud and form coal. You know, coal is always found in seams, no exception. Sometimes multiple layers of coal. Coal, gravel, coal, gravel. Well, that's the tide going back and forth, a different tide. So if the initial flood caused 900 mile an hour water to knock down all of these trees, bury them, and then turn them into coal, where did the organic material for the second, third, and fourth, etc., coal seams come from? So this is another point where Kent Hovind is contradicting himself in this video, because didn't earlier you say that polystrate trees were preserved as upright fossils, and this was evidence of your point? How can a tree be preserved upright along with delicately fossilized roots and bark, but at the same time, 900 mile an hour water is leveling all these trees, knocking them down, stripping their bark, and then turning them into coal? You can't have your polystrate cake and eat it too, Kent. There are examples of fossilized trees at Yellowstone that have both their roots and the ancient soil surrounding the roots preserved. You can't just form coal seams in less than a year by having some trees knocked over by water. It takes a lot longer than that, and it takes many stages. First, you convert the organic matter into peat, and then lignite, and then the bituminous stage, and then anthracite. All of this takes much longer than just a few months or a year. Companies that actually extract natural resources like coal, natural gas, and oil from the earth do not use a model of the earth that is young. They use one where the earth is billions of years old. And these companies need to get their calculations correct because hundreds of billions of dollars are on the line. Every six hours, 12 and a half minutes, you'd have a tidal change. Noah was in the ark for 880 tidal changes. The water came up, down, up, down, in, out, in, out, 880 times. Where did you get that number? 
And again, Noah was in the Ark during 900 mile an hour high tides. How did the Ark not get ripped in half? It'd make all these layers in one day, not millions of years. We shook this up a few minutes ago. It's already settling out. Gravel, sand, clay. Huh, give it a few more minutes, see what it does. It does it every time. The flood explains all the geology of the world. No, it doesn't. There is no such thing as a geologic column. Yes, there is. One of the biggest lies ever taught to kids in school. They say during the Archean era, there's no such thing as an Archean era. Yes, there is. This geologic column that they teach is the Bible to the evolutionist, number one, and it's an absolute lie. How can a scientific model be somebody's Bible? I think you're the one who's teaching lies from your Bible. Ha! Got him! Got him! Hey, thank you so much for watching my video. So I'm filming this for a second time because I accidentally filmed it on the slow motion mode on my camera. So before I do the Patreon outro, I just wanted to make an announcement. I'm going to be attending Faithless Forum 2021 this year in Austin, Texas. I'm going to be there on Saturday, November 21st, all day, and then I'm going to be at the after party. So come and say hi if you're attending. Okay, so now I'm going to speed run the Patreon outro. We're going to do this quick. I want to say thank you so much to David, Paul Kamish, Danny, Regios, Bob Sadler, Dave Dalafior, Pterodactyl Hunter, Martin A, Ian Chen, Jack, Stacy C, IS4321IS, and JC Magruder. Thank you guys so much for supporting me on Patreon. I literally couldn't make this content without you guys, so thank you. And thank you to all of my viewers and subscribers. I'll see you guys in the next video, and hopefully, hopefully, sorry, I forgot how to speak English. I'll see you guys in Austin, Texas, if you're there. Peace.